uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're grateful for Oklahoma Disciples Foundation for sponsoring uh, this little time together here Saturday morning to talk about uh, worship tech for non-techie folk, though I would imagine that many who are gathered here uh, have a level of tech expertise. Um, uh, given what we've been living through since mid-March of this year with the different ways in which we worship. A virtual regional minute, or regional assembly team are um, here today, uh, Jeff Champeau and Chuck Marshall and myself to provide uh, uh, some information and then engage you in conversation along the way. We're going to we'll be covering uh, down the list how to improve image and video quality, sound and live streaming, um, utilizing different platforms uh, at the same time for, for putting out your information, your streams, and then uh, talking about the pros and cons of live streaming versus doing uh, pre-production, pre-recorded information and dropping that out at one time. And then there'll be some time at the very end for um, a little bit more live Q&A if there's something that wasn't discussed along the way. So uh, again, if, if you'd like to use the chat, that feature is open and I have it here. Uh, and we will we'll go ahead and begin. Uh, let's, let's pause for a word of prayer. How about that as we start our time? We give thanks, oh God, for the beauty of this day. We remember those uh, in our state and around the world uh, living with grief and living through the time of COVID. We're all dealing with that in, in different ways. Some living with the disease, some wondering when it will come to their house. Others on the other side of that having uh, struggled with it. That's your blessing on our time together. We give thanks that we're the church in this place at this time. In Christ's name, amen. Lead off with Jeff Shampo, uh, thinking about uh, how to improve image and video quality from uh, your place out into digital world. Jeff? Morning. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Eric, for putting this together. Um, <clears throat> so one of the questions that came up as we were preparing for this was, how do I make, how do I improve image quality? How do I make my finished product look better? And uh, unfortunately, this is not a one size fits all or, you know, here's a checklist that every single church can follow um, because not only do budgets vary widely, um, also, um, you know, uh, your requirements are going to vary widely. So what looks good to one church doesn't look good to the next, but looks really good to the next. So um, with this video stuff, uh, you could spend a few hundred dollars or you could spend, uh, there's at least one church here in Oklahoma that spent a hundred grand uh, to, to improve their, uh, their production facilities and their audio and their video and everything. So, um, you know, it's, it's a very wide, there are a whole lot of things to think about and a whole lot of ways to accomplish various things. So um, I want this to be interactive. So, so think of questions and enter them in, into the chat as we go. But I want to cover a, kind of a few sort of large topics, large, you know, big questions. Um, and I actually want to start by sharing my screen and uh, or by sharing my browser. So um, the very first at First Christian Norman, the first Sunday we streamed, it was kind of a last minute. Hey, we should probably put this on the Internet for everybody who didn't come this Sunday. Probably quite a few churches did that. So the very first Sunday. I rubber banded my iPhone to a tripod because I didn't have any, any way to attach it. Um, and, uh, and that, and it was just a stationary shot and, uh, responses were positive. Uh, people were grateful to be able to watch that, uh, you know, who just happened to see it streaming on Facebook the very next week. Um, we borrowed some camcorders and we did buy one piece of equipment. Um, that let us connect several camcorders together and switch between them. And, um, and that was what we did for several months. And I'll, I'll show you what that piece of equipment is here in just a second. Um, as, we, as the months went on, um, we realized we needed something more than just some borrowed camcorders and a, and a switcher. 
So we bought some uh, better cameras, some PTZ cameras, which is a, I'll show you a picture here in a second. A PTZ camera is a robotic camera that you control with software. And that's produced the image you see. So this is a PTZ camera. Actually, I'll show you. Uh, we bought ours from a company called PT, or the, they're manufactured by a company called PTZ Optics. And uh, here's what they look like. So that's the back. Here's the front. It's a, it's a pretty small device, and it's just sitting on the ledge of our balcony. We have three of them. And this allows us to produce images like this um, and images like this and images like that um, without someone or you know without three people in our balcony moving physical cameras around so we we when we changed between those shots we used those ptz optics cameras and um and software to switch between them to give us uh, to give people watching at home whether they're watching on a small screen or a large screen uh, a reasonably good view of uh, of what was happening so um there are even even if you decide you want to do this at your church and you want to buy these ptz optics cameras there are uh, many ways <laughs> there are many ways to build a system that uses them. So these particular cameras, there are different models that have different outputs. And those kinds of technical details are not things that we're going to cover in today's session. Um, but there, but this will give you something to research. If you want to be able to switch between cameras and, and you want to have basically have it so that one person can run the live stream um, without having to have a bunch of camera operators and, you know, more like a television station, um, then this is a good way to accomplish it. And there's a Facebook group for PTZ Optics cameras users, and it's full, it's mostly people in churches using these to, to do worship services. So the cameras, but they're about $2,000 a piece. So they are not cheap. Um, and they have a couple different models with different software on them and different zoom lenses. Um, and we got the, our sanctuary is pretty long, so we got the, the 30X zoom, and I think there were about $2,200 for the ones we got, but um, they go up and down. Um, another way, uh, so I'm going to show you a different image. That um, is an image that was produced by a DSLR camera, so not a camcorder. Uh, not a PTZ optics camera or something similar. That was produced with my Canon EOS uh, still camera set up on a tripod. Uh, it has a video mode. And the reason I wanted to to point this out um, is because you, you can actually get a, if you're shooting like this, if you're shooting, um, you know, not from a long distance or you're shooting individual shots in your home office or in your, you know, in your study or something, um, and you want to be able to create an image like this where you have a blurry background. That's called bokeh effect. If you want blurry background and you want, uh, you know, better lighting and you want uh, to kind of set a scene that produces, you know, sort of the best, the best um, visual image, then you can do that with, a, with a, a DSLR camera or a mirrorless camera. And... Those cameras allow you to select, you know, change out the lenses, set your aperture, set your white balance, set your uh, f, set your um, your ISO. So cameras like that, just like when you're taking still photography with them, they give you a ton of flexibility. But it's also a whole bunch of stuff to manage and to learn. So I wanted to just um, take this a little, a couple minutes to point out the difference in the different types of cameras and the image quality you get from each. When you're shooting with a phone, um, it's obviously gonna be a lot more like this. Well, uh, it's gonna be, you know, it's going to do all that stuff for you, which means you don't have to manage it, but you'll never be able to control, uh, you know, the have, have granular control over the lighting and the aperture and, and the things you can get um, if you're trying to create an image like that with the blurry background. 
So um, when we first started, let me find one from. Jeff, while you're dialing that up yeah. uh, over here in the chat, Scott uh, has uh, noted that uh, uh, AV Pass. AVIPAS is another kind of camera that'll do the same kind of pan tilt zoom as uh, it's a little bit less expensive model depending on what your budgets are. Uh, and, and Mike was helping us all know that PTC is pan tilt zoom. So thank you. Uh, yes. Yep. Um, So when we first started, the see how the it's pretty dark. This is with a uh, this is an image from our balcony with a two hundred and fifty dollar uh, borrowed camcorder, and um, and it's not bad. It, it's actually underexposed and um, you know it's not centered just right, but um, and, and the, those borrowed camcorders had a heck of a time trying to figure out what to focus on. Um, but we got the, the, the worship out there, um, and, and people were grateful to, to have something to watch as opposed to having nothing to watch, you know, nothing to, to participate in. So, um, so maybe the, maybe one of the, one of the points is, uh, whatever your budget um, you know, you can, you can probably produce a better, a better image with a $250, um, camcorder if you, um, uh, if you, if you take, you know, sort of take the time to build the other, build the other piece. Actually, um, let me, let me change my train of thought. One of the things we tried to do with these borrowed camcorders was set, was not use autofocus, um, so one thing that, that less expensive cameras are not particularly good at, and actually those expensive PTZ cameras we bought are not particularly good at autofocus. Um, and unfortunately, each Sunday we'd have to go, go reset the, go turn off autofocus again. And so sometimes we did and sometimes we didn't. But that's one thing you can do even, even if you have uh, less expensive equipment um, to produce a better finished product. And then whatever you can do to control lighting. As you can see, this is a little underexposed. You can't really see his face very well. Um, but, um, but anyway, that's, that's the, the, uh, how we started and then, and kind of how we evolved. I, w I do want to point out, um, the piece of equipment we purchased is, uh, I was gonna, I was gonna grab this and, and have it to hold up and show you, but so this guy, the Roland VR1 HD, this allows me to this allowed me to plug in those three borrowed camcorders, and then take a feed from our sound system, um, and put them all together, and then plug into my computer, which handled the streaming. Um, and so these three buttons, one, two, and three, would allow me to switch between the three cameras I had. And, uh, and there was a little bit of a fade. It actually faded from one camera to the next to the next. So although $1,100 is not as far from a cheap piece of equipment, um, it, it, you know, gave us the ability to produce, produce a much more polished video. And actually, uh, Chuck later will show us a, a $300 version of this that, um, that is quite affordable that will allow you to accomplish the same thing. Um, anyway, this, uh, allowed us to to have the preset tight shot of David or or uh, like that and then switch to a much wider shot like that um, without the viewer getting seasick because we're adjusting the camera you know we're adjusting the, the shot on a live view so it's pretty hard to uh, to make adjustments um, while you're live, unless you have a, a really high dollar, really good uh, tripod. So that that video switcher 
um, and especially the the much less expensive. The reason I the reason I bought this one is because it was the only one in stock, <laughs> um, and I wanted to get the less expensive one, but they were out of stock and back ordered for months by the time we we placed our order. So, uh, so that's why I went with that one. Jeff, as we as you as you show us information here uh, in, in technology, the, you know, thinking about image quality and sound quality, uh, the, the backbone behind all of that before you get the hardware is your, your internet connection as you're going out. Or is it, is, would, I, would I be correct in saying that? Uh, it's a combination. Yeah. Okay. Good question. And certainly no matter how good your equipment is and your production skills and your software and all that, if you can't output a reasonably good stream uh, to the, you know, to the rest of the world, then you're going to be hampered for sure. So, we are really lucky uh, in Central Norman, in kind of the old part of Norman, um, AT and T rolled out their their inexpensive fiber products. So we have 100 meg fiber, um, which you can't even get in all parts of Norman. Um, but prior to that, we had a much slower Cox cable modem connection. Um, but I would say it's going to, this is another one of those things that varies pretty widely. Um, but I would say a minimum of 10 megabits of upstream speed um, is what you'd want. And if you can get more, we have 100 by 100. So we have 100 meg up. And we use about 20 of it each Sunday to, um, to provide the best possible uh, image. But if you've got at least 10 megabits of upstream bandwidth, then um, then then you've got a good shot at at, at least putting out a, a decent quality stream that others can watch. And of course, the people watching will, you know, if they're in a if they're watching on their cell phone in an area with bad coverage, they're going to struggle to receive it. Um, but you know, but there's not much you can do about that. And so. we and there's there's a question over here in the chat about OBS versus a piece of hardware. Um, those do a program will do basically a similar thing as that piece of hardware. Yes, no, like OBS. Depends on which piece of hardware you have. Um, I'll Chuck will uh, will explain what the perfect uh, the Blackmagic A10 Mini Pro does. It does both. Um, this Roland device we got does not do what OBS or VMix will do. Um, all it does is emulate a webcam. So when you when you plug this thing into a computer via USB, the computer thinks it's a webcam. Ah. Um, it's just a webcam that happens to produce a really good image. Um, the A10 Mini does have that streaming piece. So let's let's talk about software for just a minute. Actually, do we have that on our? Uh, I um, think it, I think Chuck may visit about that when we're talking okay. about multiple platforms and and whatnot. But yeah, so we'll um, there are. Once you have your, your components assembled to produce the image you want to produce, then there are several different ways to get that, that image or that, you know, that stream um, out to the internet. And I'm sure some of you are already familiar with, with uh, software applications like vMix or OBS. Uh, for some of you, it may be you've never heard those, those names before. But basically, those, those pieces of software will, will take your video input um, make it into a form that can be streamed and then stream it out, send it to uh, YouTube or Facebook or any number of other sources, uh, uh, any number of other services that can, that can do some magic and, and chuckle touch on that. But I, um, I do want to, I do want to uh, hit on one more, one more thing that I've seen asked in different places at different times. And that is how do I fix my wireless um, or, you know, can I use wireless to, 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 uh, to, to produce a reliable image? And the answer almost invariably is no. So uh, there was another webinar um, that I was a panelist on recently, and that question specifically came up, how do I fix my wireless? And I said, you, here's how you fix your wireless. Um, and you, you plug in. Uh, so when you use a when you use a cable like this and even if it's if it's not this is a network cable but even if it's hdmi or um, sdi or or some cable that's designed for video and not for network with, when you're using any kind of cable um, chances are really good 
when so, whatever comes in this end is going to come out this end. Cables are really reliable. Like this, we have figured this out. We know how to get data from one end of a cable to another. Wireless, on the other hand, is designed to not be reliable. That sounds crazy, um, but but it's actually designed for to to deal with interference, which causes it not to be reliable. It's designed to deal with um, distance problems and all kinds of other things. And the way wireless does that is by throwing, if it receives something that it's not sure is correct, it throws it away and says, send me that again. Send me that again, send me that again. And when you're, when you're checking your email or, or uh, you know, sending a text message, it's no big deal. You never notice uh, that all happens in the background and you're unaware. When you're streaming video, the data all needs to make it there or you have dropouts or you have bad image quality or you have any number of other things that you can see on the screen. So that's why um, running everything wired will, will nearly always, always produce a better result. So I will say um, like doing FaceTime on an iPhone is pretty good. A Apple has, has developed a really good codec and a really good way to, to make that video look like it's you know, good and reliable. But taking uh, content like we're talking about, a worship service, and streaming it out to YouTube is not, is not that way, unfortunately. So, um, so one of the best things you can do if you're trying to use wireless is just to run a cable. And if you're not sure about that, then run one temporarily. You know, buy a 100-foot network cable uh, or, or you know, a, a long HDMI cable and just try it um, and see. If you're having trouble, then, then give it a shot and see if that helps. So one of the questions from the chat here, uh, it was, can you have good speed without having a good signal strength? If you are just, uh, if your only capability is using a wireless connection or your, um, your phone connection in a sanctuary or in a space. If you don't have good signal quality, it's probably never going to be what you want it to be. So it's not going to be fast enough without the good signal quality. Right, or it's gonna it's gonna be choppy because it's gonna have to send those retries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's trying to do video over wireless is just probably going to be problematic. Um, so there's there's not really, unfortunately, there's just not really any way around that at this point. Actually, I take that back. There is, but it's very costly. <laughs> you can you can set up you know, dedicated specialized wireless equipment to, to take the place, but, but you wouldn't want to do that. It gets very costly. You'd be, it would, at that point, it would be le probably less expensive just to run cables. Can you, can you, in a few moments in this segment, uh, speak to sound quality, how you would, um, we've talked about video here in this. Can you give us some tips on uh, sound? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I heard somebody much smarter than me said one time, um, the best way to, f if you have if you have video production problems, the best, sometimes the best way to fix your video production problems is to forget about the video and fix the audio and to improve the audio. If people can't hear well, um, it doesn't really matter how how good the image quality is. So, and unfortunately, this is another one of those things where every church is set up differently. Uh, the, the specific answer to fixing a, a particular audio problem is going to vary. It's going to depend on what the problem is and, and what's causing it and what equipment and where the microphones are. But generally speaking, uh, the closer a microphone is to the source, to the person speaking or the instrument playing or whatever, um, the better off your sound will be. Like the reason I wear a headset usually when I'm on Zoom is because I want this microphone right here in front of me. So no matter what's going on behind me, um, Zoom is gonna try to get rid of that. And, and when, my, when my voice is really loud right into the microphone that's right in front of me, um, it allows Zoom to handle that a lot better. If I were talking to my laptop sitting off over here to the side, it's gonna be picking up tons of room noise. The same is true when we're talking about streaming worship. Um, if you're if you're talking into an iPhone that's on a stand, you know, several feet from you, then that iPhone's going to be picking up a lot of room noise. 
uh, or a tablet or a laptop or you know some device that's a little ways away. Um, if, on the other hand, you're speaking into a head-worn mic or a lapel mic on you, or even a, a gooseneck mic that's up in front, um, and you're and you're speaking right into it, um, you're getting a lot more of the person's voice or the the instrument or whatever um, than you are other stuff around. So, uh, the if you can take a feed from a sound system that's that you know that solves that problem and make that part of your stream. Um, then, then you'll most of the time you'll be in far better shape, um, and people will just be able to hear better um, than if you're using a single device, um, even a even a camcorder on a tripod six feet away. If you can put a lapel mic on and just plug even just a hundred dollar um, uh, wireless mic and put that lapel mic right on your shirt, it solves that problem. And there are plenty of YouTube videos. YouTube is a great source of information. Go to YouTube and say, uh, you know, search for a wireless mic demo. And there are plenty of people out there who will show you the difference in what it sounds like from a phone or a laptop or even a camcorder that's, you know, maybe four or five feet away. And then they and then they put that lapel mic on their shirt and turn it on, and it's a world of difference. It it makes the audio much much better. So and in a in a big sanctuary, a lot of times they're they're pretty boomy, they're pretty echoey. Um, and if you're picking up all that room noise and all that echo, it makes it muddy and it makes it hard for the person on the other end to hear. Chuck, we're going to move over and talk about uh, streaming to multiple platforms at the same time and, and, and see what, uh, what thoughts you have on that and how you can help us think about that. Uh, sure. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, Jeff. Um, when we started, we've been streaming for a long time. We've been streaming since... Um, well, for almost two years prior to when this pandemic started in March. And you're at Southern Hills, we should probably make sure. Southern right. Hills Christian yeah. Church in Edmond, Oklahoma. Um, so, and, and you can find us if you want to go and look back at any of our live stuff. It's on YouTube going back a couple of years. Uh, Southern Hills Christian Church on YouTube. Um, prior to this pandemic, our live stream was just an app thought it was just uh, point a camera at the chancel and uh, run a cable from the mixing console into the camera so that people could hear and we really just uh, tried to capture mostly the sermon not the entire service because the idea was if someone wanted to see what they had missed because they were gone for uh, a Sunday they could do that everything changed in March and so uh, we needed to improve our live stream so we didn't for us, we didn't feel like it was the right move to just uh, replicate our Sunday service in the sanctuary like we'd always done. Uh, we needed to change a little bit. So we needed to figure out how we were going to continue to live stream, but we needed to use the equipment differently. Um, we took our ancient broadcast camera that was donated to us uh, by the Oklahoma Wildlife Department and our ancient MacBook Pro and moved into the senior minister's office and broadcast that way. So um, moving back to the real topic here, which is the multiple platforms, um, same guy who donated the, the broadcast camera told me about Restream.io and I am going to show you that website. So uh, Restream.io is a, it's a website that you can use. It's all online. There's no hardware or software, uh, but what it allows you to do is to, instead of streaming to one location, like directly to Facebook, you can stream to uh, restream.io and they send it out to multiple platforms at the same time, multiple uh, streaming platforms. So you can send it to uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, all at the same time. So that's one aspect of this. It's very simple to use. They have a free version. So that's one aspect. The other uh, thing that I wanted to mention is um, the, the different software and hardware that you might use. Jeff has touched on, on OBS. And uh, I think, Jeff, you use vMix, correct? Right. Um, the, the, or the, uh, there's a $60 version. And then there's a, I think we have the $300 version. Yeah, OBS is free, and then VMix has several versions that are pretty affordable. 
Yeah, and I think the the three hundred dollar version is probably what we would need if we were moving to vMix, and that may be something that we do. Currently, we're using Ecamm Live, which is a Mac only software. vMix is a PC only software. Um, we only have one Mac, and so while I'm happy with Ecamm Live uh, as a software for for broadcasting, I don't like the idea that if that computer goes down, we've got to scramble and do something else. Uh, OBS works on on uh, Mac and PC. The thing that I don't like about OBS is it's the same thing. It's a blessing and a curse. It's an open source software, which means it has a lot of people who contribute to the, the development of this software. Um, it is, I think, aimed at people who have a pretty high level of tech expertise. It is not as user friendly as some of the others. Uh, that being the case, it is a, a very functional piece of software, but it's not the one I recommend for uh, people who are just getting into this. And Chuck, the OBS software or the vMix allows one to do what exactly, for those who don't know? There are hardware and software solutions, and vMix and OBS and Ecamm Live are the software solution for bringing your camera feed into your computer and then sending it out through the internet where people can view it at home on these different platforms, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Twitch, whatever streaming service that you're using. Uh, the hardware solution for that is uh, what Jeff uh, showed earlier, which is the Roland. This is the, the $295 version that he mentioned. It is uh, Blackmagic Designs, uh, ATEM Mini, and they make a $600 version that's a ATEM Mini Pro. Now, the Pro version, the $600 version is a fantastic piece of hardware because it also allows you to bypass those softwares. Uh, you can stream to the internet directly from this device. Your cameras come into it. You've got buttons that allow you to select which camera you want to show to your, your congregation. And uh, it sends out the signal without a, a computer or without that, that software. Um, I, right now, I use both. I use the, this device just to switch, and then I use the software to send out the, the, uh, the broadcast. We, we covered so many things already. I'm, I want to make sure that I don't miss something here. Um, are there any questions that have popped up, Michael, on this particular subject that I should address? Uh, no, sir. Uh, uh, Mike Morris noted that there's an interactive resource, and he put a, a link here in the chat. Uh, that's a good help center along with uh, you know, uh, utilizing YouTube to find train to find opportunities to learn how to how to utilize either the hardware or the software packages so do you have a is the the, the reason to provide multiple places is to make it easier no doubt for people to see the stream rather than requiring everybody to have a Facebook account or something like that that would be the reason why you would um, you, know, you might trouble yourself to provide, uh, to utilize this kind of software, right? That is exactly right. And uh, I'll mention some things that we have noticed about the different platforms. Of course, not everybody has a Facebook account. So uh, I think of Facebook as being the, the one that's the most accessible, but as you say, not everyone uh, is on Facebook. That makes YouTube more accessible, really. But here's what I've noticed. Um, on Facebook, we have people who connect with each other. They chat with each other while this uh, service is going on. You'll see um, you'll see messages pop up not only to each other, but to me or to uh, our senior minister, Rob Crawford. Um, we do a bit that's 30 minutes long prior to the start of service where Rob and I have a, a dialogue, a conversation, and uh, we have announcements in there and it, it serves a lot of purposes. Uh, one is to provide the information that you would normally get during announcements during your service, but it also um, serves as a gathering time so that people do have the freedom to chat with each other and with us. And, uh, it gives us that sense of connection that we miss by not being here in person. It's, it's, it's been great to do it that way. And then after 30 minutes of that, the, the service starts. Uh, we don't talk for that whole 30 minutes. People would get tired of that, but uh, it, it gives people a time to connect. So YouTube tends to be the platform that is best for that. That is the platform in which people actually converse with, with each other. Uh, the other thing about YouTube is that it doesn't matter how high quality of a feed that I send out, if I send that out in full HD, YouTube is going to bring that, that quality down to a 720p from a, 
from a uh, from full HD from 1080p, they'll bring it down to 720. Uh, so that reduction in quality saves bandwidth for them. It also means that uh, you can get that 720p uh, broadcast without as without needing as much bandwidth and in your home. Uh, you don't need as fast of an internet connection in your home to get that broadcast, but it won't be as high of a quality. YouTube does not throttle that that video feed in such a way. If I when we broadcast to YouTube, it is in full 1080p, which means better picture. So here's what people tend to do: if they have a smart TV at home, they will put YouTube on with their smart TV and watch the broadcast on on uh, YouTube on their big television, and then they will on their phones pull up Facebook and they will interact with each other through messaging on Facebook with their phones. So they'll actually have the feed on two different uh, devices in their home. Uh, so that, those are kind of the pros and cons of, of YouTube versus Facebook. And there are other streaming platforms out there, um, but these are the two that we have had the success with and the two that we use. If I'm reading, Claire uh, Meredith mentioned that their congregation, you, 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 they send out a link, I guess, to the Facebook stream that you're able to watch, even if you're not a Facebook user, is how they do it at their congregation. And that is a great idea. We have not done that, but um, I, will, uh, I will take that advice and uh, see about figuring out how to do that. Uh, Claire, if I read that wrong, please, please unmute and correct me. I think you got it right. I, I saw it too. Okay. Um, the the one thing I will say about Facebook specifically is there are I, I had a comment or two when we first started um, that they would rather that from from one there was one particular person who reached out and said I'd rather miss worship than than go to Facebook. Um, so some people just kind of have a, a, a negative, you know, negative feeling about Facebook and they're not going to click a link to Facebook, even if they don't have to set up an account. So um, I think you, I think it's good to do both Facebook and YouTube um, and, and some churches we don't, but some churches actually set up their own private stream on their own website uh, through Vimeo or, or something that they pay for um, so that people can view it that way and not have to go to any public you know, uh, any sort of public service that makes their money by collecting data about its users. So. Chuck or, or Jeff, you have a, are there downsides to just only using the restream that's free versus having a paid account? I didn't, I, go ahead, go Chuck. Ahead. I, I didn't know, I didn't know restream had a free version. So I don't yeah. know. To be honest, I can't remember if we're using the free version or the $16 a month version. Okay. Um, but there is not a lot of difference. Now, Restream does allow you the ability to stream directly from your browser. If you were going to, say, use your laptop with a built-in camera, and you could go to Restream and avoid any other software. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great tool. I haven't used it, but the, the theory behind it is fantastic because there may be some people out there who don't have um, a lot that they want to do. They can do everything in front of their laptop to send out a, uh, uh, a live service. I'm a one-man show, uh, and I know a, a couple of friends who are ministers who did this, especially during the quarantine period of this pandemic. Um, it's it's a, a great way to do it. The caveat with that is that in the free version and the $16 version, it will have a little branding in the corner that says restream.io. That's not a big deal to me. I think that that's uh, a, a small price to pay without having to spend a lot of money, actual physical money, on a... Uh, on a service. Uh, I can live with a little watermark in the corner. Sure, sure. I think that the free version only allows you to stream to one platform. I think you have to pay for in order to hit both. You could be right about that, Tom, and uh, that bears a little more looking into. And in, in, in a question that we had is, does Restream take more processing power from the computer that's running OBS? No. It will take less because a lot of the processing will be done um, on the uh, on, by by restream. Um, it should be identical. Uh, no, no, because it's still sending out only one signal from OBS to the internet. It's just going to restream before it hits Facebook, YouTube, any other platform. Yeah. Okay. Good. So let's transition to some pros and cons between live streaming versus pre-recorded content. Uh, for worship. Uh, Chuck's going to lead off and then I think Jeff's going to uh, speak a bit as well because they 
they both do a little one does one definitely so uh, check talk talk to us a little bit about that sure um yeah jeff and i have talked about this quite a bit and and we mentioned the one size fits all this is definitely nothing here about this is a one size fits all um jeff tends to do a uh he does almost every well yeah almost everything live most weeks it is completely 100 percent live we um started off live but quickly found that it would be easier for us to do a blend we do uh what we call a hybrid service which is some pre-recorded material and some live material now the pros and cons clearly if you're broadcasting live anything that happens is going to go out for everyone to see uh, if you are um, pre-recording things, you can you can edit and you can uh, do multiple takes to make sure that you don't misspeak or anything of that nature. You can definitely get into the weeds with the editing and do uh, a whole a whole lot of editing. Um, you have to kind of rein yourselves in sometimes. What we decided to do was because it didn't feel like the right thing to just broadcast directly from the sanctuary, uh, and we didn't want a lot of people in our building because we were trying to be very mindful of, of uh, the, the quarantine. We started off by having elders pre-record with their phones, uh, the offertory message, the, uh, the communion meditation, uh, and, and then send them into us and we would include those. And so you would have multiple different locations that our broadcast looked like it was from. There was no intention to make anyone think that this was a live, all a live broadcast, but while we knew we were not going to put out the perfect product, the one thing that we could do was try and make this very authentic. So we have continued to uh, pre-record some parts and uh, live stream some parts. Most Sundays we do, we have some pre-recorded material and some live material. Um, the wisdom behind that is that we just, it's really important to us to do the prayer live to do the sermon live. And then that dialogue that we do, Rob and I do in the beginning is, is generally live as well. The other parts can be pre-recorded. We started bringing elders in and recording in such a way that was uh, safe and socially distanced. So now almost everything is done in house rather than having elders send us their own recordings. But um, what we were able to do by doing it this way is to provide some continuity so that even though it's not all live, some of it is pre-recorded, it has the feel of it all being uh, a live service. At least it it all uh, has a continu continuity to it so that it, it is all done in the same set of locations. Uh, we're not trying to fool anyone and make anyone think that it is all live, but we did want the, the uh, we did want to put out a, a, a nice looking service that is authentic. And so the authenticity became important to us. We don't, we don't, unless we really blow it on saying something, we don't go back and, and re-record. We uh, often do things in one take, even if we uh, stumble over our words a little bit, because we couldn't redo it live anyway. So that just adds to the authenticity. Yeah, I know that some uh, early on that I that I helped and worked with uh, went to the pre-recorded because the the internet and the tech, you know, the hardware and the software that we're running were providing issues and so a way to a way to not be frustrated on sunday morning was to go ahead and pre-record your worship service and then just drop it all at once it's one of the reasons we did virtual regional assembly the way we did was to mindful that not everybody was going to be at 100 by 100 or a 10 megabit capable internet connection to be able to interact uh live or provide a quality sound and image uh, for the worship service, which is why we pre-recorded uh, most of that or all of that, and then edited it together. That was a that was a choice that we made. So, uh, uh, Jeff, you all chose to be live every Sunday. We did, yeah. Um, I mean, we were we were fairly well set up to to make that happen quickly. Um, so, uh, and and what leadership at first Norman decided was that they wanted the worship experience to be as much the same as possible. Um, and after, after doing it live from the sanctuary for a month or two, we got feedback that uh, one person specifically said, 
the one thing that has remained unchanged, the one steadfast thing is Sunday morning worship at 1045 in the sanctuary. And I see the sanctuary just like I always do. And I see the same people in the same robes. Um, and so to that person, it was meaningful to know that even though they weren't sitting there, that they were sitting in their living room instead, it was going on just down the street um, like it always had been. So that was um, that sort of affirmed to us that that we should keep doing it that way. Um, so, but if we, uh, to Chuck's point or and to your point, if we hadn't been set up to provide a good experience that way, then it would have been distracting, and you know we we wouldn't have been able to to do it. So, um, so to Chuck's point, there's no right way and wrong way. It's just two different ways to think about it. Yeah, I know that Scott Taylor is here, and he is from Disciples in Bartlesville, where they broadcast live on Sunday mornings. Um, uh, if you're here in visible show of hands or over in the chat, if you could just note what your congregation does on Sunday morning, um, are, you, are you live, are you pre-recorded, uh, that would be that would be lovely for us to have. We're going to capture, we're recording this, we're going to capture the chat, and if you'd be interested in receiving the transcript, let us know. We'll be happy to send that to you. Um, as you, as people can reach out to one another and look for some help, as well as from Jeff and from Chuck, so um, uh, as you all go forward, so. In case you're sitting there thinking, come on, man, I just wanted you to tell me what I could buy, because i uh, I've, I've got the theology, I've got the, you know, we've thought through this, I just need some help on which, on what equipment. Um, and this isn't that, this is just an example um, of uh, something that could work. Um, so that's two, for if your budget, the budget's $1,000, here's something that could work uh, for you, two tripods, two $250 Canon camcorders, and that Blackmagic A10 Mini um those five pieces of gear and you'd need some cables and you'd probably have to run some extension cords and this is not everything you'd need um but it but it gets you started so for a thousand bucks you could take these pieces of equipment plug them into a computer you already have download obs for free and be off to the races with the ability to switch between cameras and it would be a, a big step up from something you could do with just a phone sitting there in front or you know from from maybe one camera um, just one stationary camera streaming out to YouTube um, so in case that's helpful we can put put uh, uh, links to these if I'm about to upgrade my equipment, do I want to get equipment that, that I can grow into or do I want to get equipment, depending on what my dollar budget is, do I want to get equipment that's really going to at least upgrade what I'm doing now but may not provide for whatever I want to do in the future? Man, that's a, a question that only each pastor or congregation can answer. If you want to if you want to do what you can now and and maybe try to sell the stuff on eBay later um, versus, um, you know, put together a much larger budget. Um, that's a that's a very individual question. Um, if there are church members that have camcorders you can borrow, I would definitely recommend that if you want to if you want to maybe just get that piece at the bottom, the A10 mini um, and see how it works. Um, and then borrow some camcorders to plug in and play with it and, and see if it's gonna work for you. That would be kind of a best case scenario. Okay. One thing, one thing to note, um, this, is, this Canon Vixia HF R800 camcorder, I really just sort of picked it because I knew, uh, I know Canons almost always have uh, clean HDMI. If you take that, the, the model name and number of that camera, so Canon Vixia, HF R800 with the words clean HDMI at the end and Google that. Uh, and then, you know, read what, and if there's a particular model, you, if you like JVC, if you like Sony, then, then pick out a model and Google its name and, and model number with clean HDMI um, to determine whether or not that camcorder will output clean HDMI. This is very important. Clean HDMI means 
it doesn't have the all the camera uh, little icons and indicators. It won't start flashing battery low, uh, or or tell you how many minutes of of you know tape or or uh, digital recording space you have left, because obviously the people watching at YouTube don't want to see their screen all cluttered up with the with the stuff you'd normally see. It's important to have clean HDMI, so check that before you buy a camera. Yeah, that is absolutely a key point that I will echo. We uh, had a couple of cameras that we could not use. Right? We owned uh, a Canon DSLR camera that we could not use for this because it did not have clean HDMI. Anytime I plugged it into uh, the setup that I had, you could see all of those little things on screen that, that uh, Jeff just talked about. Uh, I owned a, a Nikon camera, DSLR camera, just like you'd use to take photographs. And uh, as it turned out, that one did have a clean HDMI. I was just lucky on that. And uh, so we ended up buying a few more uh, mirrorless handheld cameras like you'd take photographs with. They do have video capability. Panasonic Lumix uh, G7 was the model and uh, they work fantastically. Uh, clean HDMI. But yes, absolutely do that research before you buy a camera. Make sure that your camera has a clean HDMI. Thank you. Let's take a few minutes here that we have uh, to see if there are questions from the crowd for our guys or for one another. And if just uh, unmute yourself and fire away. I think, I think before we throw it to Eric, one last question uh, I would have, particularly for Jeff and, and the others who are here, uh, knowing that Chuck and Southern Hills have been broadcasting off and on for a while and, and several other of our congregations have. I mean, Jeff, do you all see yourselves not broadcasting worship when it's okay for everybody to be back in the sanctuary again, whenever that time is? Good question. I suspect we will continue. We've, we've not talked about that, but I suspect we will. I don't, I don't think we'll stop. I think we'll keep doing it even after people come back. Right. Others here, um, you know, what's your experience? Do you, that, that are, you know, you're broadcasting worship either in a live or pre-recorded or mixed fashion. Do you see yourselves continuing to do that as you, um, uh, even after pandemic time is over? So we have, um, our Facebook page keeps track of how many people touch our Facebook page each month. And as we are recording right now and dropping them, we're touching somewhere between four and 5,000 people a month. Now, remember, we worship with under 200 people in our sanctuary in non-COVID times. That's amazing. I, I want this so that we can continue to do that. Yeah. Has anybody we've noticed similar numbers, too, with, uh, with regard to Facebook. Have anybody, any of you streamed... Um memorial services we did one uh in september and we had 750 people watching live i don't know how many have watched it since but we had it was a someone very well known a, a big community person for many decades and if we'd had it in person the sanctuary would have been packed and probably standing room probably overflow in the, the fellowship hall it was uh, somebody who was very well loved and very well known in the in the Norman community, and there were almost 800 people watching live. Mm -hmm. So, and and I got a bunch of messages and things. Um, they thanked me while we were during the thing. They thanked me for sitting there, so people knew who was at the controls. And I got a bunch of messages and texts and things saying thank you so much. I I really didn't want to miss this. So. Just curious if others were doing that. I want to thank Mike um, uh, Morris here because he's he's lifted up something that we've not said anything about at all. That uh, this isn't plug and play. Even in when you even if you just hold up a phone, there is a lot of time involved in the the production. Even even with the live work to to make sure everything is connected together and. Uh, and to do that, the clergy that I know that are content creators for Sunday morning, that they are now, um, you know, that are doing the editing of all of that. If they're doing a, a pre-recorded uh, service, you know, they're uh, the, the workload to get to that 
uh, has increased significantly because it's not, even though iMovie is great and there is DaVinci Resolve and uh, other uh, software packages that can help you do the pre-recorded stuff if that's what you're doing, even if it's in a mixed uh, mixed environment of live and pre-recorded, it, it does take some time. So Mickey, you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You got the uh, Yes. Up. Sorry. That's okay. I just wanted to uh, make, make the point, and this would apply even if you're not recording. The devil is always in the details. And um, we've had some kind of funny things happen. People try to sneak in um, to the choir loft while the recording's going on and they're tiptoeing, but it's all being caught on camera. There's... Um, everybody's thrown their jackets on the front pew and all that debris shows in the video. So uh, taking a moment to stand up in the balcony, for us anyway, where the cameras and sound equipment would be uh, is very valuable to notice those things before somebody in your congregation says, why was the sanctuary such a mess? or um, yeah, I saw so-and-so sneaking in or just, you know, things like that. So the, the details are just exaggerated on video. Yep, thanks, thanks for mentioning that. That's right, you have to think about, we haven't even begun to touch on, um, you know, being mindful of what's in your background. Uh, I turned I turned my computer this way because there's light coming in from a window over here, and this way you can see all of my face rather than this much of me. Um, uh, though I have a lovely halo effect going on in about another half an hour uh, from this window with the, with the lighting. So there are, there are lots of different details. That's correct to to follow up. Michael Oberlander noted in the chat that they've added um, a video. Uh, streaming to their CCLI license. We didn't even begin to touch on that uh, just yet uh, in this setting about some different copyright issues. We'll, we'll certainly have a, another opportunity to do that and, and possibly have Suzanne Castle uh, participate in that with us who is uh, from the, uh, has a, lots of information to share with us. The Jeff referenced um, uh, an event that he, uh, a panel that he was on uh, earlier this week, the denomination at the general level of the church uh, offered a, a one hour webinar earlier this week that you'll receive the link to if you've not seen that. It covers some of this information. There's some inf a brief conversation about copyright there that you can see. Uh, so we'll make sure that you uh, get the link to that if you've not seen that to go and check that out as well. So I want to thank Chuck and Jeff for their expertise in making me uh, better at what I do at this end on behalf of the region and all of you for, for, for what you're doing in your local settings uh, as you continue to find creative ways to be a voice of gospel during pandemic time. So uh, finally, we want to thank ODF and Eric, and we'll uh, throw it to you for a few closing words. Very good. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> and, and thank you to everyone who participated and in particular to our panel members. Um, the foundation is trying to be supportive of the region and the churches in any way we can. Uh, I never thought we'd be involved in a church tech seminar <laughs> this year, but I can say that about a lot of things this year. <laughs> but with that said, we continue to look for ways to help the churches and help the region and be supportive. And if any of you have any ideas, uh, things you'd like to see, uh, please call me. Uh, we we want to be... Um, the support that the region needs at all times. God, God bless this region with the foundation. Uh, and in this time of Advent, it's, it's good to ponder uh, God's preparations for us. God called the disciples to give and create the foundation and what we're doing now through the permanent endowments is being enabled by those 
preparations that were made years ago. But God's still calling us. He's calling us to prepare, to make straight the way of the Lord, calling us to give and calling us to live. He's calling us to prepare the way through the technology that's been given. And this seminar today was a beginning on that, and I suspect we, we may have more of these. I, I don't know about our panelists, but I, I was enlightened by all of this. And, uh, and I think we really have just scratched the surface. And, and I think it's always better uh, to have the input of a group uh, that we can all share that information. It is uh, something that's very beneficial. But would you pray with me? In closing, Creator God, we ask your blessing on the information shared this day and on all those who gathered to exchange it. Help us to do your will and to make it known through all the tools you have provided us. Guide us and direct us in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.